brought to you by Brass and Unity. We make wearable conversation starters. Our new buddy check packs are available now. Grab one and check on one of your closest buddies. They may need it now more than ever. Go to brassandunity.com, use the code UNITY, and get 20% off. And let's all heal together. And brought to you by Combat Flip Flops. Bad for running and even worse for fighting. Combat Flip Flops are your ticket to the unarmed forces by providing you with military-inspired quality footwear for men and women. To help support the podcast and in support of women in developing countries, head over to combatflipflops.com and become a part of their unarmed forces today. Be sure to use the code UNITY at checkout and get 25% off. And brought to you by GFDA. Good fucking design advice. The voice in your head and the foot up your ass. GFDA makes prints, drinkware, and apparel for people who want to do their fucking best. Go and use the code UNITY and get 10% off now on anything on their site, including our collaborative product, Fucking Help Somebody. And brought to you by Daisy May Hat Co., the custom hat company based in Nashville, Tennessee. They make custom one-of-a-kind hats from wide-brimmed fedoras to cowboy hats. All of their hats are 100% beaver felt, and it's the highest quality hat you can get. They also have the coolest shirts ever. You can use the code BRASS at checkout for 15% off your entire order. Go and check out daisymayhats.com. Embrace the fever. Live the dream. And brought to you by American Yogi. In a world increasingly driven toward the grind, find your outlet for peace. American Yogi is a mindfulness-based apparel and wellness brand with international retreats, free classes, and rad clothing and accessories to support you along life's journey. Find American Yogi on Instagram at liveamericanyogi or at americanyogi.com. American Yogi is proud to support the Brass and Unity podcast and its community with the code BRASS15. Join the mindful counterculture, live American Yogi. Chris Elise is on the show, everyone, and I am so thrilled to have him here with us because he is someone, after learning about his story, seeing the support he's been given to the boot campaign, I had no choice. It was no doubt in my mind. I had to talk to this photographer. This guy, not only does he have style, so if you're listening and not watching, please go watch the YouTube. His hair is on point. His clothing's on point. His rings are on point. This guy is fly as fuck. I am so excited to have Chris Elise. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very honored to be uh, your guest. Thank you. If you guys haven't noticed, Chris is from France, not Quebec, France. And this is going to be a fun interview for you because I, I we have so much to talk about. I've learned about your history a bit. Uh, I've kind of, you know, really dove into how you got to where you are as a photographer. And what I love the most about you is you have the traditional, hardworking, immigrant type story but the other thing that I realized too, coming from you was I did listen to another interview and you were willing to have some hard conversations about some topics that I do want to get into today. And I think that is the difference between the interview that you're going to give uh, versus someone else. You're not afraid to shake the tree a little bit, are you? No, not at all. I mean, I, I kind of find like, I just cannot be happy for my life for the blessing I, I got. And I just cannot be grateful if I'm not trying to have a positive message and the positive message I try to give people sometimes goes against the mainstream and it's not like people don't like to hear it, but I just cannot just say, oh, I don't care. I'm just a happy man. My story, I'm fine. I got a great story. People think it's so bad in America or this, it's bad. It's really not my experience. It's not the experience of a lot of people. I, I, don't, I cannot be silent about it. That's okay. Yeah. Those are the people yeah. I want to talk to. I don't want to talk to anybody who's going to give me a reverberated answer that their PR yeah. has cleared and said it was acceptable behavior. I want to hear what your real thoughts are, your deep thoughts are. So let's get yeah. right into it. You, my friend, mm. are from France and you yes. have not been in America too, too long. No, I've been traveling in the, I, I've been traveling all over the world for the last 20, 25 years. And I, I have a lot of them in America, but really all over the world. And I moved to the USA like a little more than 10 years ago. So I've been in America for 10 years as a resident. I've been a US citizen since June, 2021. The same month I, uh, I celebrate my 50 years of birthday. So that was very, a, a great month for me. But uh, being traveling in the USA for 20 years, I, I got a deep understanding of the culture and the country and the people here because I travel a lot. I, I, I've noticed and I realized like I travel in America much more like most of American people. You know, I've been in so many states, so many places, rural uh, cities, et cetera. 
so I kind of know America for, for a long time. Mm -hmm. And it's because you are an NBA photographer and you've also been a photographer for the, uh, what is it? The bull, what is it called? The PDR? PBR, PBR, PBR. the freelancer, the professional bull riding, bull and rider, so yeah. Okay, so how does somebody from France decide, I'm going to be a photographer, I'm going to go to America, I'm going to make it, I'm going to be the next big thing? How does that even begin to come into someone's like mindset as a child? Okay, I, I've got, I'm going to try to give you the short story, if I'm not the too long short story, because okay. I, can be, I can talk a lot sometimes. But basically, it's simple. I, I, I was in love with America as a kid at six, seven years old. Uh, I always said the same story because that's my story. My grandfather didn't speak one word of English, but loved Western movies. My grandparents were living 10 minutes from my place, my old childhood and teenage years. And, uh, and I used to watch Western movies with my grandfather. And as a six, seven years old kid, boom, love with the landscape, we love with the cowboy, we love with the girl, we love with all the things like mythical about America. And then I, this love never, never fade, absolutely never fade. I actually grow up, I become a kid, become a teenager, the teenager read books. You know, back in the day, three TV channel in France, I was born in 1971. So I grew up in the 70s and the 80s, no internet, no cable TV. So a lot of time in the library. And I was kind of a nerd. I was, a geek. I was not the cool kid at all uh, when I was young, not the cool teenager. So I learned about America like kind of in a, through, through um, books and then TV show, but always the same, etc. And for a long time, because of my a, a bragging, I'm from a very modest family. My father was in minimum wage. My mother was in minimum wage her entire life. She's retired now. So I would say like, even thinking about going to America was too much of a dream, a big dream for me. And I grew up like this. I, said, I love the country. I learn as much as I can. But I was never planning to live in the USA for a long time. And the funny thing, like actually when I went, uh, I turned past 30 years old. Then at some point, I had like the courage for, courage for myself to say, I want to live in this country even for a few years. And I want to try to pursue this dream. And if I don't do it, I'm going to spend my, maybe I'm going to be a very happy man in France, blah, blah, blah. But at some point, I might say, oh, I wish I would have lived in the USA. So I started to say, I'm going to try to do it at 30 years old. And when uh, I kind of, uh, there was like a, a limit, like a, a, yeah, a boundary is a limit in my mind. And when I break this limit, there was like no, no, no dream were too big enough. So I was like, okay, I need to have a plan to live in the USA. And uh, at the same time, I say, okay, I love sports. Being a sports photographer would be so cool. So it was crazy because I went from the first 30 years of my life, I've had 23 years between age 6, 7, and 31, 32 years old, when I was like, oh, I love America. I know a lot of things about America, but never even have the goal, the ambition to live there. And suddenly when I decided, I had no, no limitation anymore. I was like, I'm going to do it one way or another. And at the same time, I was like, not only I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do a cool job, you know? So I decided to be a sports photographer for two reasons, because it was cool. I was like, oh, that would be so great to cover the NBA, the MLB, et cetera. And second, I was like, I have this accent. I was a writer, a journalist back in the day. I was like, I'm not going to be able to compete in writing with American-born people, American-born journalists. So I was like, if I switch, because it's still telling stories. If I mm -hmm. switch for the writing to the photography, then my accent, the fact like I'm, my vocabulary is not extended, it doesn't matter anymore. If I'm a good photographer, I can walk and I can sell my picture back to friends, et cetera. So I can, I can do it like this. So basically I went from not being ambitious to be like, I'm going to do it. And then says, no dream is too big. So let's become a sport photographer. Let's do something super cool. So no dream is too big. I'm writing that down because I think that's amazing because people don't understand how much it would really take to up and leave the country you're born and raised in yeah. and go to a completely foreign country across the pond and hope for the best. Did you speak English yeah. by then? Yeah, I was good. In, I was good in English because it comes like when I was a kid, I love America. So I was uh, in uh, high school, junior high school, uh, equivalent of junior high school, junior high school. I make 
classes, you know. So I always speak English, but I always like, oh, I'm not like an, an English man or an American, so it's not going to be good. But yes, I, I could speak English, yeah. Did I read something that you served in the military? Yeah, a little bit, but it was like a long time ago. And I know so many people and so many people like you, you serve at different age. For me, it was the beginning, end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s. So I didn't serve on, it was before the war on terror and all this stuff. So it's like, it's, I'm proud of my service, but it was like, mostly I did the training, etc. I didn't do like any great, great operation of a theater of operation, which is also, I didn't have to face like really big challenge and stuff mentally and physically like all the soldier like uh, at so you signed on the dotted line my friend you're yes, still the I same did. person so yeah, that yeah. still counts in my opinion so Thank take you. that for and what I, it's I, worth I, I jumped I jumped from an airplane which was the coolest <laughs> 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 I was a part cooper so it was cool it was really cool yeah I could Love see it. I mean what why did you decide sports and not say military photography or war photography? Or was there no interest in 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 covering you know, was, issues? No, I mean it was way, you know, I, I enrolled when I was like just out of high school. I did one year of college and then I dropped college. I enrolled and it was more than 10 years later than I decided I want to live in mm. America. So it was really different. And at the same time, I was kind of smart in the business model. Okay, I want to live in this country. I need to make a living. How, how can yeah. I make a living? There's a question of the visa, etc. So the simplest thing, because I was a I was a journalist, a writer for a long time. I knew like the media business. So I was like, kind of, the NBA is very popular worldwide. Back in the day, we always like friends. Always have around seven French players playing the NBA, and we are like big name, like Tony Parker. Be, become an NBA champion many times, Boris D or uh, Joachim Noah, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So I knew there was a market for me to live in America, to go in America, have a visa as a journalist, and sell my picture in France, so make a living. So it was a business model which was like immediate, like in like I could make it. It was like I had a plan, you know. Yeah, it sounds like it. I know yeah. I just had a uh, NBA champion on the show two weeks ago. Festus yeah. from the Golden State Warriors. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I was looking at some of the photography he had sent me and I had wondered, I was thinking to myself, I wonder if Chris has taken any of him because that would just be a ironic yeah. timing, if anything. Um, I, shot, I shot six NBA finals and also the Golden State Warriors, but not the last three years, unfortunately. Oh, that's, yeah. I mean, the time would have cool. been... Fantastic. I mean, yeah. that would have been incredible to be able to be yeah. around. And I've heard you speak about the power of being in an environment like that and the way that you articulate how powerful it is, the energy that comes off of a stadium when you're shooting photography. But I wonder if you're able to articulate it better, maybe because you were a journalist and you have the ability to really put it into words as well as into, into film, into photography. Yeah, but the thing is, like, you all come back. Like, I started to be in love with basketball at a young age. There was a professional uh, basketball team in my hometown in France. Back in the days, they were really good. The team is not that good now, but they were really good. And the center, uh, by the time, the center of this team was also the center for the team France basketball. He happened to be a childhood friend of my father. So mm. at age maybe nine years old, I went to, to, to watch a basketball game live and I saw this giant and the game, for me, it's like, it was like, it's a game of giants, you know. It is. <laughs> this guy was, I think, 7-1 back in the day. He was the tallest. He has been for a long time the tallest French basketball player. So he was really, really a giant. So the thing is like, then I love basketball and we started to have the NBA Finals uh, live on TV in France at the end of the 80s and I started to watch them you know to wake up at 2 a.m to watch them live and if you fast forward at some point I was in 2009 for my first NBA finals I was sitting on the floor and in front of me I had like Kobe Bryant dribbling the ball against Michael Pietris which is who is a French guy also from the island from my father you know they didn't know each other it's another generation but it's kind of like life, life sends you like some, you can see some message in your life sometimes, like, you know, like the way the cycle of life and stuff happen. So the thing is like when I shoot photography, it was, for me, it was like the fan I've been like for 30 years 
has the best seat in the in the arena. And the way I was seeing the game, I see the game like fans. I don't see the there's excellent photographer, but we, they are photographer. They can mm-hmm. shoot anything, and then they shoot sport. And they happen sometimes to shoot only sport, and they happen sometimes to shoot only the NBA. I was a guy who used photography as a medium to to live, to work, and live in the USA, and to shoot to use photography because I love sport. Having this spot on the floor, like. And to be paid to have this for the floor would be fantastic. So my view is very different. So it's kind of like the way I shoot sports, the way I shoot every sport, I want to pay homage and respect to the athlete, the athlete in front of me. And uh, so one of the best compliments I had at the beginning of my career from non-professional photographer, but from people is like, you, you, you shoot, you, you made photography, you do, you do photography, I would love to do myself and to put on my wall. So that was a great compliment. And a lot of guys who love basketball back in the day was telling me, oh, you, you see the game the way we see the game. So that's maybe my little difference. There's so many fantastic photographers. You are talking about this player of the Golden State Warriors. The NBA official uh, team photographer of the Warriors is a fantastic, incredible photographer. And there's so many of them. So you got to be different. My difference is like, I was first a lover of the game. I was a fan of the game. And I'm like, wow, I'm sitting here. I better do really great. And I'm very, you know, make like them beautiful. And that's what I do. That's what I try to do. It's, I think something people don't really discuss when it comes to photography, and I am no photographer. You can see that from my Instagram, but I definitely put the effort in. But the point is, I think the difference between sports photographers or correction, extreme sports photographers and Uh photographers are drastically different. I think they're stark. I think individuals who shoot photography still are not able to quite capture the essence of what a professional athlete's movements need to look like, or you Mm -hmm. need to look like to capture the life into a photo. And I think that's Mm -hmm. why your photography is so brilliant is you are truly an extreme sports photographer. I don't see you as a normal photographer, although- the pictures you did send me of your dog are so ridiculously good that most people couldn't do that. If they sat down Googled it and tried to figure it out and you snapped them in a second, Mm -hmm. you have an eye for this thing. You see how things move and flow and you're able to capture them in the flow rather than the stagnant still, like a lot of people do. I think that's what makes you stand out. Also the way you edit and the the coloring of your photos and the pop that you give them, you see things like you, that individual said to you, you see yeah. them the way we see them. And that is incredibly hard to translate onto film. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. But you, you kind of write about the fact like for basketball, especially like when I started to shoot basketball, I kind of like, I was a bad basketball player because I, I, I play soccer my entire childhood. I'm, oh, I'm a French yes. guy. My father, yeah. <laughs> six, years old, six years old, he put me, he put me on the soccer field and I was out of the soccer field at 14 years old. And uh, I, at 14 years old, I was like, I'm not going to play basketball because I'm going to play basketball again. Guy who started at six years old, like I started soccer. So I finally play organized basketball. I was 20 something and I was bad. As I, I say all the time, I was a good defender. And my son, Patrick, always say, yeah, yeah, that's what like terrible players say. They are good <laughs> defenders. They were good defenders. He's right. He beat me. He was 11 years old when we did our first pickup game together. He beat me like it was horrible. Anyway, but the way, because I know the game, I play the game and I know the game. I know like all oh, this movement is so cool. When they're going to lay up like this is so cool. When they go, they're going to protect the ball is so cool. It's really the cool factor I knew as a player and I know I was so bad me doing it. So when I see it, I'm like, this is it. Clack. I have the frame yeah. right now. And um, and it's easy. And then you have like sports photographers who are just good at the job and they figure out without knowing the sport. So right. my, my, my little asset, my little advantage, like I knew the sport and I love the sport so much like immediately I was like, this, this is a movement I need to get. That, mm-hmm. that's a, but yeah, that's, um, that it makes a lot of difference to have a very love and understanding for the, for the sports you shoot. A hundred percent. I know the industry my husband comes from, he was a professional supercross racer in the stadiums. Mm-hmm. 
And mm-hmm. shooting that photography is a very different thing than shooting a still and watching yeah. it done when they're in the air and catching the movement of the riders and the depth in the eyes. When you can mm-hmm. get when you can get photography like that, it invokes an emotion. And for mm-hmm. me personally, and I don't know how you feel about this because I know you've taken some time off of social media recently, but mm-hmm. up until recently, for me, I found Instagram to be the most... most- when looked at in a proper amount and not death scrolling, it can be Mm -hmm. inspirational. It can be beautiful. When you see a good photographer who is able to take their art and just put it out there for the world to see, and they might not, nobody else may may not have seen it before if they don't follow those sports. I mean, the Mm -hmm. platform itself, I'm attracted to photography and video over words like Twitter and photography Mm -hmm. invokes an emotion in people that, Mm -hmm. It's it's hard to describe. Yeah. 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 It, it's it it's so true. Uh, it's to the point like sometimes, and I'm not I'm not faking being humble, but sometimes people, are, oh yeah, great photography, etc. And I know I do the job. I know I'm a total legit photographer, sports photographer. But there's some people sometimes, there's some guy, let's just talk about the NBA photography. There's some people sometimes I see one photo of them and and I follow them. I know them for long. I know them. They work in them for a long time. And I'm like, this is it, you know. And it's kind of like, I'm like, I'm not good. I'm good for you until see this guy or see this photography. And, uh, and it, it's tough sometimes, you know. I'm, I'm not ashamed of my work. And I, I'm not like, you know, I'm so, I'm here and they are here. But there's some guys, there's some photography. You see one photography. You're like, uh, I might spend my entire career, and I have spent my entire career to try to get some photo close to what this guy do mm. on a daily, if not a weekly basis. Mm. So, so, there's a talent for this, which is like you know, and we say, and I it get back to what you say because he said even more like than words, etc. It's like it's the emotion. It was the beauty of the photography. There's different level. I'm a photographer, so I know all the composition, the uh, the exposure, etc. Everything was perfect. But it, it's more than this sometimes. Yeah, photography it's, has this powerful. It's powerful. In in my opinion, it's one of the number one most important pieces of art in the world. Photography yeah. is the thing that captures the happiness, the light, the loss, yeah. the depth, the, the, the hatred, the, the darkness of the world. And yeah. we, I, I think because of social media platforms, we've overlooked the importance that photography can play yeah. in our lives because it's just like, oh, I got to put a piece of content yeah. out. I got to put a piece of content out. But if you look back at the history of photography and you really get into it and you start to look at things like photojournalism, you look at things mm-hmm. like like the Gaza Strip, you look at things yeah. like World War II and, and, yeah. and Vietnam. The Vietnam War, the Vietnam War and the photography during the Vietnam War. Yeah. You just, you can't, you can't unsee it. And when, when you see photography that has come out of war-torn areas, the way that Vietnam came out, the way that they, those journalists were able to capture the depths and depra- depravity of what people were going through yeah. in an unnecessary war. Photography, in my opinion, is, is the most important on top of, you know, journalism in general, mm-hmm. as long as it's objective yeah. journalism, is, is the most important thing to keep our histories alive. Yeah, I totally agree. It's even matter much more than video, especially in the world we, we, we are now. And I totally agree with you. Like, you know, I use Insta. I went, uh, I opened my Instagram account. I, I don't remember like a long, long time ago, but because I was like, okay, I'm a photographer. I'm going to need Instagram. Okay. Right. But uh, so, so it's ironic to see like everybody take photo now and the understanding of the power of the photography and the understanding of the composition and the understanding of the beauty of this art is so low. It's like we are, as a civilization, civilization completely uneducated about photography, completely uneducated, and there's never been more people taking pictures. So that's kind of weird. But when it comes to um, the trace in uh, the trace 
in history. I mean, you, it's a with you, you. We are witness of history with photography, and photojournalism is really important. So when it comes to this history and journalism, photography as an art is very important. But for instance, when you say me, painting is a ultimate ultimate art. Mm. And painting is actually much more. I cannot paint for my life. I might learn some technique. I might, but this is, I don't undermine myself when people say, oh, you have so much talent. So people say, some people say it's a compliment. When photographer and I say it, then like you, you believe it. But I don't know. I think it's much more having an eye and having skills. Hmm. But let's talk of my friend, Mark Majori, the painter of the American West. He's a great friend of mine. I mean, this is pure raw talent. Mm -hmm. And in the, and again, I'm not, I'm not putting myself down, but my career as a photographer will never leave this same trace as this career as a painter. So the art of painting is even more important for me in the longevity of the world like photography. Even if photography, we were just talking about photography from World War II, from Vietnam War. So obviously it lasts. But the painting is the ultimate art for me. And they, it, you need really real talent, you know. And uh, you I'm do. always proud of some of photo. I, I'm proud of some of my photography. And some of them I'm really proud of. It. I mean, like, if, you know, I'm like, yes, yeah, this is what, this is, that sum up my, my life as a photographer. But any, any painting, my friend Mark Majori has some in, in the place, in my place right now. Every painting he does is like, Ow, you know, this is ultimate. This is, this is ageless. This is forever. This is eternal. You're going to have to send some of those, like I, I need I will, photos yeah. of those because I yeah. need to know what you're talking about. Because in my yeah. opinion, I think that painting, yes, that's the difference. Painting, you need that, that touch, that real talent to be able to put mm -hmm. it down and see my sister-in-law is an artist and she can draw like you couldn't pay you couldn't hold a gun to my head and say replicate that i wouldn't it, it could yeah. never happen but with photography there's something that seems accessible to others and absolutely i'm not sure if it's because of youtube nowadays or googling or what you're able to mm -hmm. learn online but it seems to be more of an accessible art uh for mm -hmm. generations to come my question to you about uh photography is why do you think that your photos or photos in general will not stand the test of time like a piece of uh, art in terms of a painting would? Oh, first of all, for, for my, my line of work, it's sports. So, and I love sport and I love the history of sport. I'm, I'm, I'm an history buff in general. I have a college degree in history back in the day in France. I love history, but it's sport. Sport is not that important. You know, we mm -hmm. can, we can position it in a, um, the history of a society, etc., and there's some movement, etc. But basically, it's still sport. It's still entertainment. I've been shooting the NBA for 16 years. I retired for following last season. I shoot the NBA, and I'm proud. And I have some historic moment of the NBA. You know, I was there when Derek Rose became MVP. I have some, I have some historical dunk of uh, LeBron James. I was Kobe Bryant during the NBA finals, etc. But it's just sports. So in my line of business, it's not, it doesn't matter that much. People who are going to cover some even photojournalists really matter. And sport, it's, it's, a, it's a niche of photojournalists, but photojournalists really matter. Photography of what happened in the society. I'm not talking only about war, but any kind of, mm -hmm. this matter a lot. In my business, again, not putting myself down, but this is only sport. And I think it's, it's healthy to not consider anybody working around sport. It's really healthy to not consider all that like so important. Mm. There's something which is always kind of like amuse me and upset me at the same time. It's like all these sports journalists who want to give their opinion about the society and, and social injustice all the time. You're a sports journalist. What, what do you think like, because you cover the NBA, the NFL, et cetera, you are you entitled to have an opinion. But you're supposed to be a sports journalist, you know. Right. And that's and that kind of like, and it's funny like this guy a sports journalist and very successful sometimes. Is that not enough for you? If mm -hmm. you wanted to be a political commentator or a society commentator or, or or 
or doing big investigation would take a lot of hard work, you know, mm -hmm. and you publish like long reportage or you publish book, do it. But it feels like, are you not, obviously you feel like you're the lower pole of journalists because you feel like I need to talk about something else but sport. And Overcompensating. So my, my, overcompensating. Me, when I say my photo will the last, you know, the, the, you know uh, it's just sport. As great as my, my photography is just sport. It doesn't matter that much. It will be remembered for people who love sport. When I shoot the Kobe Bryant die, I shoot my first NBA final was Kobe Bryant in 2009. I shot him in, a, in the Olympic Games in 2012. I have mm -hmm. stuff who matter to everybody who loved Kobe Bryant, who loved the player, who loved the, the game. But that's it, that's it. Mm -hmm. He was just a fantastic NBA player, a fantastic athlete, and I'm just a photographer who did a good photography of them. It doesn't matter that much. The, See, it matters to the people, it matters. It doesn't matter in the big scheme of things, in my opinion. I think the reason I'm going to push back a little bit, just get, mm -hmm. bear with me. I'm going to push back a little bit because I was a competitive athlete most of my life. Mm -hmm. And I, I get the point that when you say, it's going to matter to the people that care about that sport. It's going to matter mm -hmm. to those around who who are you know uh, obsessive about that those for those mm -hmm. photos are going to stand the test of time especially yes. anything to do when somebody passes and as tragically as kobe did mm -hmm. so i know fezzi told a similar story about meeting kobe for the first time and it was very reminiscent of the same one uh similar to you standing on the line watching kobe right in front of you yeah and it was a beautiful story but i think the thing with sport that is different to me is that Sport holds a, a very special place in society, in my opinion. Sport has the ability to pull people from every tiny town in any part of the world and give yeah. them an equal opportunity to become something bigger than staying in mm -hmm. that small town. Yeah. Sport mm -hmm. in North True. America, but you have a European view of this. So this is why I think there's a bit mm -hmm. of a difference. For North Americans, at least for me, sport is, uh, and I'm not talking even America, sport for me was more of a safe space, a community builder, uh, yeah. a, a moment to build self-confidence and uh, the ability that I could be something bigger if I just put all of my energy, my time, mm -hmm. and my care into it. Sport saves communities and kids from gun violence and gang violence. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, the whole saying is, Sport mm. can keep people out of trouble. If you want your kid to stay out of trouble, you put them in sports. You keep them so busy that they don't know that they can go and get into trouble. Yes. Sport yeah. Yeah. can transform an entire country. For example, look at Brazil. Look at Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Look at yeah. the boom the Gracie family has had around the world. My That's son true. goes yeah. to a Gracie Barras. You know, yeah. my son is in jiu-jitsu because of that. Um I think that sport is bigger than you realize. And it means. Okay. You convince me. No, you convince me. To this point, I, I agree with everything you say. And for instance, like uh, my father died in 1997. In 1998, we host the, world, the Soccer World Cup in France, and mm -hmm. France won the uh, World Cup. Uh, he was a generation of men, a generation before him, like who were waiting the entire life to see because we had like huge defeat against Germany in semifinals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We could not, we could never get to the final. Not only we get to the final game and we won the final game. And in 1998 in France, we won the World Cup, and the entire country was in the street. And right. the last time it happened was in 1945 when France was liberated. That was the last wow. time. Historian, historian has actually the fact, the entire country, I was there. So I understand for this, this moment like this, I understand everything you say about sport. But then it, it matters it matter individually, it matters for people. But my art as a photography, mm. it's still an art of memories. Mm. What matters is like, we watch sport, we, we practice sport, 
We even mm. complete that matter and agree with you. And we have this, this communion with sports. That can matter. What I do, I'm just a witness of this, and I keep great memories mm. for book, magazine, or for individual, for people. That's in this area, I say, it, it matters without mattering. Because in 1998, it doesn't matter. I've seen some picture of the final game two years ago, for instance. I never went back to see picture of the final game. My memory is like the old friend's was in the street. And I saw that my father would die one year earlier. I said, I'm mm. going to choke up a little bit. I say, I, I was like, yeah, dad, you missed it. You missed it. But so this matter, my photography, of the photographer who played the game, yes, he's going to the book. But as you say, yeah, you can watch the book, but what matter is your son doing, doing the sport? It's you competing, it's us. Uh, on on Saturday, I was in this in this spot that my place at the guest house, and we were watching Tennessee versus Alabama football game, mm -hmm. you know, college football game. And I'm not a fan of college football game, but I was with Guy, and he was fantastic. And they won the game. Tennessee won the game. It was the That's first right. time since 2006. It was fantastic. I have a, a video. My my wife posted it. posted. I was shouting. I was not even born in the USA. I never <laughs> went to college in the USA. I love it. So you write, I just like, I want us to like, yes, you write for people. I'm talking about us, sports photographer, sports journalists, etc. This doesn't matter that much. We, we just, we're very lucky to have like first seat to this event sometime mm -hmm. or to have the opportunity to have a few words back in the day with Kobe Bryant, to have a few words, you know, uh, I'm a Chicago Bulls fan. Uh, mm. When I was shooting, uh, when I was in Los Angeles, and Derrick Rose was playing with New York, and then Detroit, other team, Minnesota, not Detroit. Uh, I don't think. When he was warm up before a game, he was sitting next to me, and we were talking a little. And me, I, I love him as a, a former Chicago Bulls player, MVP. Mm -hmm. He make us, he make us proud to be Chicago Bulls fan, you know, when he became the MVP, when the team was so close to be DeBron James in Miami and they did not. And I love talking to him. That's a privilege. He mm -hmm. doesn't make me important as a sports photographer. And, and that's why also I never be a groupie. Like I never used my position to try to hang on with NBA players or stuff because I was a mm -hmm. professional and that was a privilege as my job to be there. I'm not supposed to get some autograph to hang out with them. I hang out with them. It's an invitement. It's always been the case when a, a, a player say, oh, would you like to go for? Yes, I did it. But, you know, so it's just like the sport matter. Everybody who work around the sport, it's a privilege. We, we're not that important. We do mm -hmm. a job as, and it's a privilege to do this job. I still think it's more important than you realize, <laughs> but I'll leave it at that. I'll Good move day. on. <laughs> right. You're French. I know we could go back and forth about this yeah, all yeah. day long. <laughs> I'm a little stubborn. No, but That's you, you, you write about the sport and the importance of sport. You, you're absolutely right. You on, on this point, you're absolutely right. I, I try to extract the professional around the sport mm. for the importance. We not. I'm not as important as Kobe Bryant. No matter how great my photography was. I and think. I have great photography of him. Right. But he, he left something when he, when he died, which is much more important than any beautiful photography, me or any other sports photographer we have done of him. It's just a nice memory. But you think about him when you look at the photography. The photographer doesn't matter at all. You know, which I think is a mistake because I think if we didn't have those incredible photographers or individuals to cover these things, this wouldn't matter. The only reason people get to see these great moments, these things that they left behind, those emotions, all of that, that's only because of you. If you right. did not exist and nobody shot that, this would be another guy oh. running up and down the court, mm -hmm. shooting a ball into a hoop. You got to remember the things mm -hmm. you capture are the reason people love him have this feeling towards yeah. him that evoke this hair about basketball. If that wasn't for taken in a good way, listen, if the NBA hired me to go shoot photography for a game, mm -hmm. people wouldn't watch basketball anymore because yeah. 
Right, I don't Katie. see what you see. I can't invoke what you can invoke. So if you weren't there, the care for them wouldn't exist. Yeah, you right. You you absolutely right. That's why I that's why I, I retired from the NBA because mm. they do everything in their power to uh, to make a job difficult and to mm. make a job not interesting anymore. And really? I, so I yeah, and also yes and. And sometimes when I see also athletes, not all of them having kind of like a disdain for the journalists who ask questions or disdain for, you know, they don't care about the media. And I understand because the media criticize them. But you're right. If there's no, the media, if it's not on TV, if it's not in magazines, it's not like, you don't make your millions. You just you don't matter. You don't matter at all. That's why in here, you matter as you can be in high school football in some part of the country, especially, and you're gonna matter because the local newspaper are gonna, you know, because the football matter. In France, until you play professional soccer, you don't matter because right. you don't have this media surrounding, you know. Exactly. So yeah, some sometimes people forget forget this. I I, I agree, but be, uh, individually they don't respect. Etc. That's why, like, when I started to shoot the PBR, I always say this: that the best sports professional organization I ever work with worldwide. Really? Because oh yeah, because they totally understand. We let's be blunt: they totally understand. We sell a product. We have this incredible guy who write bulls, and. We need a sponsor. We need a TV partner. We need diffusion. And we need photographer. If photographer coming and get great photo, good for us. And they respect, mm -hmm. they totally understand it. And all, most of organizations, they forget, they completely forget about it. They mm -hmm. treat you with a, a form of this then, which is like at some point, you go, you know, you get older. I'm 51 years old. I'm not that old. But at some point, I'm like, I'm... No, I'm done with this bullshit, you know. I, I think I, that... I shouldn't, after 16 years, I shouldn't have to fight. I'm legit. I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to fight all the time. Like, I kind of need a, a floor on the, a spot on the floor. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be upstairs with a 400 millimeter. Be, you know, because at every level, I don't deserve this bullshit. Right. And because the picture, and I did picture from the floor, who are not part of the history of the game. And fair enough, if I'm gone and I'm done with, with the sport, I'm done with the NBA photography, they still photo, etc. But you know what I mean? They don't respect what you do. Right. It's like you, oh, you're disposable. Yes. So I retire myself from the equation. So they want to, that's the other thing I think people forget is there is, in North America, we are really spoiled rotten. We really are. We don't, yeah. we, we don't have a lot of problems in our life. So we create problems. That's what North America is known for. Whether people want to hear that, sorry, get over it. It's true. Yeah. And it's true. you see that from an outside lens, but you also see that mm -hmm. from working within the inside, the thing that the NBA and any other major sport agency don't realize, or whether they just think that it would never happen is that if these sports photographers, if these journalists, if these people just stop showing up at your games and mm -hmm. stop questioning you when you're in the locker room, no one, none of your sponsors are going to stay. No one's mm -hmm. going to watch you. And mm -hmm. those million and million and million and million dollar paychecks you get for standing, holding a basketball. Don't get me wrong. It's a very hard profession mm -hmm. or playing baseball or football. Football is a different thing though, because you're quite literally destroying your brain for entertainment. And I, str I cannot mm -hmm. watch football because of CTE and traumatic brain mm -hmm. injury. But mm -hmm. my point is, if these people that you find to be irritating or difficult or you don't mm -hmm. want to interview you, then you need to go get another job because eventually yeah. the world will realize there's bigger things to worry about than a bunch of dudes running up and down a court with a mm -hmm. ball. There's other yeah. things to pay attention to. But North America does a very, very intentional, great job of going, these are the problems of the world all over yeah. here. Look at this. Look at this sport. Focus on this sport. If you focus yeah. on this sport, then you can't focus on anything else that's going on around you, mm -hmm. which brings me to my next kind of more controversial question, which is, I heard you speak about the NBA and Black Lives Matter. Before I mm -hmm. let you go off on this, 
I just want to preface the fact that now it's sitting here, uh, October 18th, 2022, we are all very aware of the corruption and fraud that Black Lives Matter seem to have from the outside mm -hmm. perspective, in my personal opinion, not accusatory, but in my personal opinion, seems to have been a big, fraudulent, huge movement. And the mm -hmm. NBA decided to jump in on that for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... So what do you want me to say about it? Like All right. So let's start here. You come from a country that is very different than America. You happen uh -huh. to be a black man. So mm -hmm. how were you raised? Were you afraid of the police as a child? Were you afraid that the cops are going to come in and kick your door in and take yeah. you down because you were black? I'm going to keep saying what I'm saying, but the, the thing which is kind of be, can be frustrating is like a lot of people want to hear one story and that's the truth. They don't want to hear anything else. So I've been diminishing my opinion, the value of my own experience uh, many times to, uh, at every level. I'm gonna keep saying it. Uh, I'm gonna start by a statement. America is the least racist country in the world when you look like this. Or when you look like this, let's talk because Obviously, black is really matter that much in this country. But when you're Latino or anything, when you're not, not white, the least racist country in the world is America. How can you say this, Chris? Maybe I can say this because I've been traveling this world for 30 years. Uh, I'm actually, yes, I'm a, I happen to be black. The color of my skin is black. My mother is white. My father was a black man from the West Indies. Uh, a small island called Martinique, a French island, and it was nothing completely black. And people, because I have to precise this, like, oh, well, maybe it was like skin, etc. My father was like a mix of Teddy Pendergrass and Marvin Gaye. Wonderful, <laughs> beautiful. He was an handsome man. You have no idea. I, I, I get like 10% of, of the charisma and the beauty, and he was a woman, and a great man. Anyway, the... I've been traveling this country and I've been traveling the world for 25 years. When I grew up in France, France is a, uh, le pays des droits de l'homme, the land of human rights. We invited the, the chart of the human rights, etc. And so we, we, we praise ourselves to be so not racist, etc. You come to, you come, the first time I come to visit America and before, you know, this is a country when you see minority at every level of power, which is corporate, whether it's political, corporation, entertainment, sports, anyway, you see people of color, you see minorities at every level. You're in the US, in France, it's here and now. We never, we never had a prime minister which is black or from uh, or immigration. Immigration is from Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, uh, and Black Africa because we had colonies for a long time. And then we give it dependency to colonies, but we have a, a, good, a lot of connection. Uh, during the 60s, 50s, post-war, we have a lot of people coming from Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia to build France again. And then generation of the children who look like, look like, um, that they are not, not even mixed, but they look like Arabic people, you know. We have this for a long time. We never had like a, a, a French president who looked like them. We never had a prime minister who looked like them. We have some politicians now started to be like this. In the, I think it was in the 90s, beginning of 90s, we had the first national TV anchor was a black man in the 90s. In the 90s in France, Whoa. it was a revolution. A revolution, and you know what? Which is funny. It's a little little parenthesis. He happened to be a total handsome man. He's handsome. He meaning like it's kind of like he was black. Did he ask to be handsome because you couldn't? He, he, do you know what I mean? He was almost yeah. like a product, a marketing product. He always bothered me, like you know. Anyway, so we had this stuff, and he was like a. It was so great. So. So France can praise America for having elected Obama a few years ago and twice, and then they elected another president, Trump, do not, and suddenly the country is full racism. When France doesn't look at itself and you know and see the 
classic racism in the society. When your name is Mohamed in France, good luck to, to find, good luck to, to have a job interview, good luck to get, a, a, um, um, an, uh, to rent an apartment, et cetera, et cetera. He has been like this all the time. When I grew up, when I was a young teenager, I was in a very white city. I've been arrested by cop just to check, uh, to um, pull over, you know, I, I wasn't driving, but arrested by cop just to check my ID for no reason all the time. It happened all the time. Uh, so it always had been like this. So compared to this situation, we don't have the same violence you can have with the police because we don't have the same society neither in France. So you cannot compare everything like the same way, but at the same time, recently there was a lot of protest in France against the cost of living a few years ago called the, the Les Gilets Jaunes, the Yellow Jacket. And there was like a, what a lot of people say, police violence and police brutality and people lost some eyes because people, uh, police were not shooting at people per se, they were shooting like this uh, rubber ball Rubber bullets. Yeah, it can be dangerous, etc. Anyway, so this is my whole point. Like first, like you need to understand. So besides France, I travel in Africa, I travel in Black Africa, North Africa, I travel all over Europe. I've been to China, I've been to Indonesia, I've been to many countries, I've been to Russia. It's 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 upsetting to me, like people I mean black American, black Americans say like, oh America is so racist. And especially the NBA player like LeBron James gonna take a dump on America, say nothing about China. I can tell you for a fact, I'm sorry to say, I'm not sorry to say, the most racist country I ever been as looking like this was China. I've been to China. If you're not a, if you're not an NBA player, if you're not a star in China, you look like this. You can have like reaction for people in China, like like you're monkeys. They're gonna do in front of yeah. you. They're gonna do this stuff. That's a reality. The second place when the only time I really fear for my safety in a big city in the world was Moscow, Russia. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I could see long that. Time ago, and I did. I was a journalist back in the day, a long time ago, and we went to Moscow on a, on a on a journalist trip. I was I was an expert in information security. I was meeting a big CEO from a, from a Russian company. I came to the hotel first time in Moscow. We had a dinner like two hours. I decided to go for a, troll, a walk. I go to the subway. In ten seconds, in fifteen seconds, because I'm always aware of my surrounding and the level of danger. I get this for my military pass, I guess for my training when I was young. So I'm always aware. In 10 seconds, I decided you need to get back. Chris, you need to get back to the hotel because the way I, I was not safe. I could tell it right away. And I'm not a guy easily scared and I'm not a guy, I was not raised with this famous race card. Mm -hmm. My father never talked to me about racism. Did he experience racism? Absolutely. Did I experience racism in many countries? Absolutely. Which country I never experienced? I don't, I don't say there's no racism in the USA. It happens like in 25 years, I never experienced racism in this country. And when you call about systemic racism, sh show, me, show me in this country where you cannot get a job because you're black or you're Latino. Show me in the country where you cannot succeed because you're black or Latino. So look at what I, a French guy looking like this, I, I, I achieve and succeed in this country. And not to the actual, I couldn't have achieved the same thing in France. We cannot compare because I wanted to live in the USA. So it's not like I tried something in France. I, I felt I was I had a great job in France. I was, I was very successful for where I came from. My mother didn't go to college for the high school dropout. My father didn't go to college, both a minimum wage. I went to college, I had two college degrees. I got, I got a great life. I got a great job for a long time. And I, I, I make some money, I make some success and less money, et cetera. But I'm very successful because I'm a very happy man. I have a lot of things. I have a lot of blessing in my life. It's really tough to achieve this in France when you look like this, whether your name is Chris or Rabat or Mohamed, or, you know, or, you know, if you from your parents, you were born in France, but your parents from Morocco, Tunisia, et cetera, it's very difficult. And, and so, 
Black America doesn't have this perspective because they focus, and you say as in North America, we spoil and focus on our own mm -hmm. issue. So I'm not blaming the Black Americans. I'm blaming that's the way we, we are. And Black American in this culture, they focus on their own problem. And there were some, there is some issue. There are some issues. And, but the, we, Black America, the civil rights movement went from, from very, I mean, the progress is astonishing mm -hmm. to the point where there was a Black president in this country. The pro, twice, but the progress in France is re, the progress, the progress in America is like this. Hey, you, have you checked in with yourself today? How are you doing? How are you feeling? Have you had enough water? This is your midday check-in, brought to you by Midday Squares. Big breath in. <sighs> I'm back at it. In right. France, in France, it's like this. Yeah. It, yeah. So I, I cannot stand to, to think like this country is racist, the police is racist, etc. Uh, compared to what? Mm. And that's a question. It's like compared to what? Because he might... There's a lot of feelings. There's, there's not a lot of experience. Of course, there's experience. I mean, I didn't grow up with money. I didn't come with country with money. Uh, so I, I don't have the experience for growing up at 14 years old, living in the hood, living in South Central LA, and maybe being arrested by the police. There, there is a bad history of the LA, LAPD in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, probably. Yeah, that's a, that's a fact. But you need to compare where you come from, and you need also to compare to the opportunities. The opportunities for any minority in this country, America, are, are huge. And again, compared to other countries, they are really huge. So, so I, I cannot, I'm like, and I know so many immigrants from so many countries, whether it's so South America, Central America, whether it's African, Black African country, Nigeria or other country, or Europe, people who are not white, who want you to live in this country, or who come to this country because they, they were running from the country, etc., as legal or, or, or become political refugees, etc., and most of them, like the nine out of them, they say the same thing as I say. This is a wonderful country. This country, USA, is a wonderful country. And it's still the land of opportunities when you're not white, much more than any other country. But the only thing we hear from, from some corporation, from some sports organization, from athletes who have a huge platform, as they say, is the opposite. I cannot stand LeBron James saying stuff like, and I saw it when I was interviewed by Prager. You like saying like, we we as black people we 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 are friends because we never know when we when a cop leaves his uh, his home in the morning if he's gonna have an argument with his wife, he's gonna be a bad mood, or he's just gonna want to shoot a black man. So you are telling me that in this country, yes, there's so many black, there's so many. Cop, or police officer who leave in the morning with the idea, I'm going to shoot a black man today. This is so, this is, this is a lie. This is a complete fabrication. And leave one gen with dozens of millions of followers saying this to kids and people. We're going to believe it. And you know, LeBron James, when I was living in Santa Monica, I'm very fortunate. When I was living in Santa Monica, I was living 10 minutes away from where LeBron James is living. In a very wealthy, which he deserved completely. I was living in a wealthy, and I think I, I, with my wife, we deserve it. We could pay the house. So we were living in this area. He was living 10 minutes from me in a very wealthy, wealthy neighborhood with close to no black people. So you're surrounded by white people who are so racist. The Brentwood Police Department or the Santa Monica Police Department, I don't know if this is one of the most, I, I don't know, but they have white cops. So you, you're in an area where you're surrounded by white people, then we white cops. And you, you're not afraid every morning 
uh, LeBron, like somebody going to shout you. I mean, it, it's infuriating for me. I'm talking too, too long already, but it's infuriating. It's infuriating. You're not. Because it's compared to, to what? It, it's, it's a, there is racism. We never going to end racism. And this is a marketing to say, stop racism. Yeah, we, you need to fight people racism. Last thing I want to say, you need, you need to interrupt me there. But last okay. thing I want to say, I always say something. Good luck, to, good luck being a racist in America. Yeah. I mean, are you kidding me? In any line of business, if you slightly racist, you're done. You're done. You're going to yeah. lose your job. Now you can lose your job when people are going to think something you say or the way you act was racism. You don't even have to say to someone, oh, I fucking hate you, fucking n well. You, you don't have, of course, if you say that, you expose right yeah. away. Yeah. But, I mean, is this country which is so racist? Uh, really? Good luck to be racist in the country. If I was a racist in the country, I would be like, where could I be? I cannot be, I, I'm going to, I cannot be, I can, I can work anywhere. I right. can work anywhere. I can interact with this society if I'm racist. If you mm -hmm. slightly racist, if somebody supports your racist country, you lose, you lose your place in society. Yes. You can be banned by social network. You can be banned by friends. You're going to be, and for good reason. But mm -hmm. my point is like, the, show me the racist because I don't know any racist in this society who have a predominant position, except it's maybe our actual president. Yeah. Well. So the history of being a classic racism, but he's Democrat and he said the good thing is, but he has an history of it. It's so it's obvious. People tell you, America is so racist, systematic racist. The same people is going to elect Joe Biden, who has a long history with no doubt of being a classic old generation. I'm going to give you his old man from an old era. But it doesn't change the fact like he was racing when he was talking about busting back in the day. He was racing to the point when he was telling people, if you don't vote for me, you end black. And people don't think this is utterly racist. So no. my point is like, you can be racist in this country if you one side of the political mm. uh, uh, chess board. And it mm. disgusts me. Good luck to be racist in America. Trust me. What I struggle with, um, with, with this whole, the cultural divide is it is very manufactured in my opinion. And uh, I'm not, like you said, everybody can have their opinion. So take my opinion for what it's worth when you're mm -hmm. listening. But I can tell you, having known as many immigrants as I know, having worked with immigrants, having served with American immigrants who got green cards in order to be in the American army so that mm -hmm. their families could leave Mexico or Salvador or anywhere else that they're fleeing from real true violence, mm -hmm. I can tell you, your opinion is very similar to theirs where racism feels like it's a manufactured, of course, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. America has a history of severe racism that yes. you can't forget. It's there. Absolutely. We can't forget. Yes. And we're not going to forget. Listen, things have happened in this world that are tragic or horrific, but they are not happening the same way they are saying they're happening now. It's just mm -hmm. not the truth. And when mm -hmm. you start to put people in a box and start using that word at like a racist, that is horrific. That is damning. The mm -hmm. internet never, ever, ever forgets. And your mm -hmm. life can be ruined by somebody yeah. calling you something that yeah. you may have absolutely no, not even close to being a racist and, individual. And you have no defense. You have no defense. No man. defense. It's and that's, and that's what I loved when we started this conversation before we started uh, actually having the conversation. When yeah. I said to you, I was like, what do you know about me? And you're like, I don't look online because I want to know the person. That's the difference mm -hmm. is our generation does that. The generation after us mm -hmm. is not doing that. We're quick to judge. We're quick to say, and we're quick to read a little headline mm -hmm. that may say something from 
some professional athlete who apparently mm-hmm. because he has a hundred million followers or she has a hundred million followers, mm-hmm. their opinions should matter over those mm-hmm. of scholars and people that are running these countries. Mm-hmm. But the problem, like you said, is it comes from the top. And I think, you know, that from a military standpoint, mm-hmm. shit rolls downhill. So if you have a bad leader, which Canada and the United States, in my opinion, right now have lack of leadership on a grand scale. If I just even talk about Canada, just an absolute disaster of an example of a leadership. And then you have the vice leadership who is known for being a racist individual who put people in prison and held them in there so that she Mm -hmm. could use them for their own gain. That's Mm -hmm. what you call racist. My prime minister did brown face three separate times and he's yeah. still the prime minister of Canada. Yeah. Most and people- the, left, the left, even in this country, going to praise him. It's insane for me. But that's what I brought. I wanted, the reason I wanted to bring it up to you is because I think there is this understanding or this perceived understanding that we can't have this conversation. You and I, right now, the conversation mm-hmm. we're having is unacceptable. Mm-hmm should never be talked about yeah. because how mm-hmm. dare you talk about something that could be controversial, something that could actually be truthful or something that you could actually be attacking social mm-hmm. justice for, because this woke movement needs to knock the fuck off. Mm-hmm. It is dangerous. It is harming people. And it is corrupting this tiny little generation that we are having now grow mm-hmm. up. And they're thinking that the worst thing that ever happened in the world happened in the past hundred years. They don't Mm -hmm. want to talk about the things that are happening now that we are driving towards that are going to cause them to not even have Mm -hmm. a planet to live on. Because if Mm -hmm. you have those conversations, then you're crazy. You're right wing. You want propaganda. You're Mm -hmm. a racist. You love guns. You love freedom. Mm -hmm. God forbid Mm -hmm. you have any of those mindsets. Because if you do, you won't be welcomed in to the the public sphere of podcasting or producing or photography. Mm -hmm. You can't grow if you're honest. And that's the Mm -hmm. sad truth. And the only person who seemed to have broken that barrier for people like me doing this for a living are people like Russell Brand, Joe Rogan, Lex Friedman. And all of these Mm -hmm. individuals are saying, hey, this is bullshit. Yeah, yeah. America really loves to whine and complain and create its own problems and then talk to the rest of the world about the problems that they created that aren't happening anywhere else, Mm -hmm. but are perceived to be happening everywhere else. And it's absolute disgusting behavior by a lack of leadership. And I believe that is just the fact of the, it's the truth. So I'm going to get a lot of trouble for this. I think, I think it's it's true though. The sad thing, yeah. But the sad thing is like when, the summer of riot, you know, and the Black Lives Matter and stuff happened last summer 2020. It, it was because I never really talk about political stuff like this. But at I was like, no, 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 that's not right. And I started yeah. to talk. I started to talk on my Twitter. I don't have Twitter. I don't. In the last year and a half, I deleted my Twitter account, my Facebook account, my NBA photography account. On Instagram because I was like I'm not giving money to and to the to Instagram with my photography and I'm done with the NBA I don't want to promote the NBA anyway I did but I had a Twitter summer of and I see stuff and I'm starting to talk on my Instagram story on my Twitter on my Facebook and I say my experience and I was and the thing which is sad like I have so many people who contact me by private message on Instagram or on Twitter and I say. Thank you, because, you know, I, 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 yeah, I agree with what you say, but I cannot say it. And mm. why they couldn't say it? Because they were white. Mm. Only because they were white. And I understand that. I understand that. But that's a sad thing. But the saddest thing is that when I started saying it, some people who liked me before suddenly didn't like me at all. And some people who liked me for everything I was, uh, uh, suddenly, everything I am, and I was, and they love me for who I am, and I was, and I'm saying simple things, you know, a lot of, a lot of my wife, friends, or not friends, but people she knows, etc., love me because when I met my wife 10 years ago, they know, I'm, they know her for many years before, etc., and they love me because obviously I made my wife very happy. She mm-hmm. had two sons, became my stepson, uh, 
I love my stepson like my own blood. You know, they are mm-hmm. my sons. You know, they have their father. I respect this. I'm not but I, they know this. I mean, I, I would take a bullet for them. I love them like my own sons and I have a great relationship. I love them. So, and I was dedicated to this family life and dedicated. And they love me. And I was always, and I was black, immigrant, fun, cool, mm-hmm. good stepfather, good husband to the dear friend. That's who I am. Mm-hmm. The minute I started to talk about, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> I said, you really gonna, I, you, you're gonna vote for Biden and Kevin Harris? The minute they didn't like me anymore. I was the same man, but they really didn't like me. And I always say something like between Republican and Democrat, and it's not, I'm, I'm not giving, I'm not giving a pass and a free pass to, to Republican. I'm much more conservative, like I'm a Republican or a Democrat. I'm, I'm a conservative first. Unfortunately, I cannot be a Democrat with this Democrat party uh, nowadays. But I always right. say, when I never talk about politics, I had friends who are Republican and friends who are Democrat. They were all loving me for the same reason. I mean, not bragging, I know. They were like, he's a cool dude. He loves cars. He loves stuff. He's a great stepdad. We love Chris. And they were like, oh, he's French. He's immigrant. So I know, retrospectively, the Democrat thinks, oh, he's from the left because he's a French immigrant, black. Mm -hmm. French, progressive, immigrant, and black. He's going to be thinking like us. And the Republican was thinking the same, or oh, he's from the left, a French guy, a uh, uh, black, a French black guy, immigrant, hey, it's going to be a progressive liberal. I was living in LA by the, by the time. And when people realize, oh, you're actually pretty conservative, you actually, and you denounce a lot, of, you, you're against Democrats, you're against the left, the left right now, etc. The, rep, the demo, Republican was like, oh, a Republican friend was like, Oh, that's funny. I was sure you were like a liberal progressive, you know. But they loved me when they knew. I, they right. saw I was a liberal progressive. Well, and so they, they keep loving me, but they loved me before. The Democrat, the, my friend Democrat, who loved me when they saw I was like them, thinking like them, suddenly didn't love me at all. Mm-hmm. So again, it's kind of a cliche, but who is the, the, the side of tolerance, the side of inclusivity? That's not the Democrat who, like, when they were thinking, oh, it's a French black immigrant, he's going to speak like us on every topic. And they loved me for years. But when I started to talk in 2020, they didn't love me anymore. The Republican who think, oh, he's a liberal French Democrat. Oh, yeah, okay. They loved me when they knew the story. And that's a, that's a big difference. It's, you know, uh, that's a big difference. They loved you I'm when you were what they wanted you to be. Yes. When a side, I must have been one side, so I was like the liberal Democrat. Right. They were loving me for who I am. Yeah. yeah. And you know what's so crazy you, is yeah. when, when, I signed, when I signed the deal that I had, I was instructed by those in, in the film world, mm-hmm. just don't talk about politics if you ever want your story told. Yeah. It doesn't matter how great it is or how bad it is yeah. or however, whatever it is, it could be the greatest story that could ever be told ever. Mm-hmm. But if you say the wrong thing there, Kels, it's over for you. Yeah. So when mm-hmm. I signed with a publisher that was more right wing then not because I'm even American, I'm Canadian, Yeah. <laughs> but because there was questions about it and the questions from my old agent was, well, do you, well, slow down. So I said, I really like to work with them. He goes, slow down. I don't know if that's the right career move. And I said, why would that be? And he said, well, you know, they're a little more right wing. They, 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 they promote a little more guns and a more of this. And I said, you read the book that you're representing, right? He said, yeah. I said, okay. I just wanted to catch on here that we're in the same page, but the whole conversation yeah. led to the same ending and always does. Yeah. Don't say anything controversial. Don't say anything racist. Don't say the C word on TV, Kelsey. That's all yeah. we ask of you. And yeah. do not address your political stance. Yeah. I thought I got a free pass because I'm Canadian and everybody hates Trudeau and they should. But yeah. apparently I don't. And no. I think that's silly. I think I talk about a lot of things and I ask my guests hard questions because at the end of the day, 
people might perceive us as one thing, but they don't actually know who we are. And if you mm -hmm. don't give them a chance to learn who you are, you're never going to give them a chance to find the community that best suits you. And I think mm -hmm. as a, I don't even own a gun because Canada just changed the laws okay. again. So I can't have mm -hmm. a gun. So if I don't own a gun. I believe in very simple rights, the right to mm -hmm. have a gun if I choose to have one mm -hmm. and the right to teach my kids what I want to teach them in school. I feel mm -hmm. like those should be pretty common sense, basic things yeah. Yeah. for just human rights in general. But our yeah. society, North America, like I said, we haven't been tested. So like, you notice how every war we've ever fought in, at least mm. in the past history has been somewhere else. It's yeah. been in another country where mm -hmm. that country can't really do anything about it. Canada and America have never been tested in the sense that we have never had somebody knock on our front door and yeah. say, I'm here to take everything from you. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we create problems. We create serious, long alphabet problems that mm -hmm. don't need to fucking exist because mm -hmm. nothing else is interesting in our life. So if we don't create the problems, then what do we complain about? Yes. Nothing, because we shouldn't yes. be complaining about anything because we live in a society that is beautiful, but we choose for whatever reason to look mm -hmm. through a lens that decides that it is, I take these glasses on, I put them on and the world is falling apart. There's murder, everyone, mm. black people yeah. are being gunned down in the streets. White people are doing it. Cops should be defunded. Kids should be taught whatever. Kids should be transgender at two. We think, oh, this is the world that we take our glasses off. And if you actually just got out of your own bubble, looked up from your fucking screen, walked around mm -hmm. and talked to a few people, what you would mm -hmm. realize is that this is a beautiful community and we need yeah. to give it the credit it's due. Yeah. Bad things still happen. Do not get me yeah. wrong. I'm we, fully we don't aware. Need, yeah. But we, we don't even know utopia. It. Yeah, we don't even know utopia. But to think like, yeah, I, I'm I'm outraged by the fact like we put in the mind of young people yes. like they should be scared of this kind of people. They should be scared of the police. They could, should be scared of this kind of state because they are red state. Like, when we moved from California, my, my wife born and raised in Hollywood. She went to Hollywood High School. She's an LA original. There's a few people <laughs> yeah. like that. Spent her entire life, mind you, six months in New York City, her entire life in Los Angeles. We moved to Tennessee. And we moved to Tennessee. We moved out of California and we chose Tennessee. We moved out of California when she decided to tell me at some point, she said, because I kind of wanted, I want to imply, I can want to move out of California when we're going to be empty nester two years ago. You know, and... Uh, she, two years ago, she told me, okay, when our youngest son goes to college, I think you're right. We're going to move out of California. We're going to change life. When we, we finally choose Tennessee, we live in middle Tennessee, 40 minutes from Nashville in the Atlantic countryside. She actually had like a lot of her friends in Los Angeles who are like, are you not afraid for Chris being a black man in Tennessee? No. But it's, it doesn't surprise me. I've, I, I, I know people, I'm going to make the show itself because but I know black men, a, a black guy I, I love, he was coaching baseball with, for one of my sons. And we had this, um, this baseball tournament in Omaha, Nebraska. Mm. He was, and I'm not mocking him, we had a conversation, he was worried to go there. When, when he was not like the tournament was there, he was worried to go there. He was like, he was worried. But I'm not blaming him. A lot of things in this society make him like believe for a fact. If you go to this place, he's redneck and he'll be. Me. And trust me, they can kill a black man. And they're not, you know, he was worried. He went, he had this conversation with my, with my wife, for instance. He talked to my wife about it, not me. He went there for the tournament. He loved it so much. He said, that's the most nicest people I've ever met. And it sounds like a cliche, etc. But it, it not, he could have, he could have, by the way, he could have had a bad experience because there's mm -hmm. assault everywhere. He actually That's loved it. these few days of tournament in Nebraska and the people at the hotel we met, the people we met at restaurant, he loved the spike. And me, I traveled this country before I had any kind of money, etc. I traveled this country on the budget when I was a journalist, when I was a sports photographer. And I went everywhere and I went to a lot of rural rural places 
But I had one chance. I, I was one luck for me. Nev nobody put me in my mind like I was in danger if I was driving to South Dakota in the middle of November or mm -hmm. driving to some place, you know, uh, everywhere in Texas, etc. Nobody put me in this mind 20 years ago, like, oh, no, no, Chris, if you're black man, don't go there, there. And I, I so I did it without having this mind. Mm -hmm. And my experience was, is beautiful. And I'm, I, I, I visit, I travel across, I drive across this country, and I've been to so many places. When I know there's a lot of, especially black, yeah, black young men and women who are going to be sure I cannot go to Kentucky, I cannot go to Tennessee, I cannot go to Texas. That's so sad. I had people in Los Angeles when I was going to Texas because we were going to Dallas for football game because of my younger son loves the Dallas Cowboys. We were doing this stuff. People were like, oh, you're going to Texas. Like we did disgust people in Los Angeles. So it's like all the time I see the flyover state. Los Angeles, New York, maybe Miami, San Francisco, they are America. They are part of America. They are not America. And actually, this famous flyover state, this is America. And when you fly, when you fly over this state, when you look down, what do you see? You see feed and feed and feed. You see country more than you see cities. This country is beautiful. And like it or not, this country is country. You know what I mean? This yeah. is not, and the flyover state, that's the country. But we put in the mind of people, you need to go to New York to LA. If you stop around Midwest, South, etc., it's just like redneck and stupid and racist people. And you know, but that's I so live sad. In middle, that's so sad. That's so sad for, for everyone I mean, because they're missing out on me. Amazing people. They're missing out on traveling. They're Same afraid the opportunity. of like the, the boogeyman, right? Yeah. And if yeah. for whatever reason, what I don't think people realize is the people from the top that are telling you that all that they're doing is putting fear in your mind and fear is a motivator. And if they can yeah. get you to yeah. think or think for a second that you can achieve what you want to, then they can, what they can do is they can change systems around yeah. you so that you yeah. think that it's helping you and it's advantageous, but really it's just harming you, coddling you, putting you in mm -hmm. this box and telling you, you're not good enough to judge the world for yourself. Let me tell you how terrible it is. Mm -hmm. Don't go try and look, don't go look. Mm -hmm. no. Let me tell you how bad it is. Yeah. That's so sad. You know what? I have one friend of mine, and we unfortunately lost touch, not on my wedding. But the one time he told me, like, you know, we were moved, when we were actually, we bought in Tennessee two years before, one year and a half before we actually moved. We wait for our younger son to finish high school in Los Angeles. And he told me, uh, we were talking about voting, et cetera. And he told me, oh, no. I, I, he said, anyway, he said, I will never move to a red state. And I didn't say anything. And it, it was kind of mm -hmm. an attack because I was moving to Tennessee, which is very right. You know where he's living? In oh, Chicago. God. The just murder capital of America. In Chicago? And you say, I will never move to the red state. Yeah, because that's, that would be so terrible compared to the dream like Chicago is. And I have living a little bit in Chicago. And oh. that, so it's sometimes you're like, people are brainwashed. Yes. By, you well, know, that's... They don't want to think by themselves. And, uh, Thinking and for, for yourself people, is we, dangerous. Yeah, it's dangerous. It's dangerous to the point where the president, I, I come back to this, when a president tells you, if you, don't, if you don't vote for me, you ain't black, it, not only that's racist, but how can, you, it, how can you like follow a guy who says something like this, even if you're not black, even if you're white, you can say, this guy is telling to black people to vote for him because if they don't, they're not really black. I mean, and it's all about the fear, you know, the control, the shame. I mean, it's, it's disgusting. It's, disgusting. it's blind leadership. It's blind. But, it's, yeah. it's, it's just blind followers. It's, uh, there's, a, there's a gentleman in our community, and for life of me, I can't remember his name, but he has this concept. It's called lions, not sheep. It's very simple. Yeah. Thinking for yourself requires a lot of effort, a lot of thought, a lot of mm. um, really sitting down and thinking about what do I as a human being, individual, outside of influence, outside of social media, outside of pretty much my family, who am I? Because what, I guess the thing that I was going to ask you next, and a lot of people, people really struggle with answering this. And I've realized that when I ask it, so mm -hmm. it's made me realize 
who are you truly? Who are you, Chris? I'm a, I'm, I'm a man, definitely a man. And uh, I'm a man in love with this country and, uh, and I'm a Christian. That's and not one of the best answers. <laughs> not necessarily in this order. Of, I mean, you know, of, and not one is more important than the other one. But, but you asked me this, that's funny. You asked me, and you, you got me very um, not prepared for this question, which is fine. You shouldn't be prepared to answer this question. But it's funny you asked me this because uh, I'm, a ter- I'm at the turn of my life. We empty nester with my wife, which hit us really hard. My wife a little more. She's a mother. She's a born mother. She has uh, a son, my son, but, you know, a, she, mm-hmm. she gave birth to these two boys. One is going to turn 23 years old uh, next month, and the, the younger one just turned 19 years old. We moved to this place, we, and we have a lot of things and a lot of signs. You know, who, I'm at the corner of my life and a part of my life when I'm incredibly grateful for everything I have and the people. I have like a right there, if I talk to my wife, I have a neighbor close by, which I met, like when we bought this place, he bought this, he bought this place one, one week after us, we, we met. And I'm at this point of my life when uh, a lot of things make sense mm. in my journey. A lot of things make sense. And you ask me why I'm, I'm a man, I'm a Christian, and I'm a man deeply in love with this country. And it sounds cheesy, et cetera, but this country gave me so much. This country is so beautiful and it's kind of anything or anybody. Nothing is perfect. I'm not perfect to my wife. She's not perfect, my wife. She's actually, that would be cheesy. She's perfect for me, but she's not perfect. Nobody is perfect. Mm-hmm. This country is not perfect. Again, compared to what? You know, I'm very ashamed to live in this country. I had opportunities in this country, incredible opportunities. And I, had op- I know I love my homeland of France, but I had opportunities in this country I couldn't have in France. And again, I spent f- close to 40 years of my life in my homeland. And the last 11 years in the USA, I have some good element of comparison. I had a great life in France. I dearly love my country, my homeland. I dearly love my um, uh, the history of the country, the country, the culture, etc. But this country, America, it's something special, and it pain me. It pain me to like we raise as a society a culture of people who are going to be afraid, who are going to whine, who are going to complain, who are going to argue. Yeah. And. And I wish, I wish they could find what I found. And it goes beyond even like coming to America. You don't have to leave your country. To buy. But I wish they could find what I found. And, uh, and it's a long journey, but life is, life is, I'm going to say like really cheesy stuff right now, but life is really beautiful. And it's, a, I was, I have been scared a long time in my life. I grew up being scared because I was this shy, insecure children. My parents separated around I was 10 years old. My father was a black man from the West Indies uh, with a culture which is was very, um, he was a hard man, you know? So, yeah. And, and me, I was growing up with not like the, I was shy. And so I've always been, I was a not cool kid, etc. I was scared a lot of time in my life. But without realizing it for a long time, I did everything against my fear. Mm-hmm. For instance, my wife realized me, she, she really get me because she's a, she's a very smart human being and a, a very, she understands people, she read people. And she said, I have a, 
have a trait of character uh, is her ex-husband has the same one. The fact like we people will need their own. We are very homey people. We need to be home. And actually, I traveled the world for 25 years. And I put myself in a state of discomfort my entire mm -hmm. life. Uh, I enrolled to the Special Forces in France when I was 19 years old. Before this, I did the, 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 the paratrooper school, the pre-paratrooper school. We had this pre-paratrooper pre -paratrooper school in France. I did it at 18 years old. Like that. And I was scared of heights. You know? <laughs> I was at my grandparents' uh, uh, six, uh, um, six floor apartment before I, I went for my, 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 my training. And I was looking down the balcony. I was like, what, what <laughs> am I doing? So, and anyway, and I did this all the time. I didn't want to travel per se. I, want, I didn't want to live in America. I didn't dare to want to live in America anymore until I was 30 years old. And mm. I 30 years old, I finally decided, I want to try. And it was uncomfortable, but it was my own fear. At least it was my own fear. Nobody put fear in my mind. And mm. now we put fear in the mind of a lot of stuff. You cannot do this if you're black. You cannot do this if you're white. You're gonna be, uh, if you're a woman, you cannot do this if you, uh, Latino. you cannot, if you dis you're uncomfortable in your own body. Yes, that's normal, you should change sex. We put fear and we, we, we kill the wheel of fight or, or dragons. We don't fight or dragons, we don't fight or fear. And the only way to find peace and the only way to, to grow up and the only way to achieve anything is to, it's to fight, to fight this fear, to fight this dragon, to fight your, your, your Everything you makes you anxious, everything which is uncomfortable. And my luck in life, like my father never put me this. I say this sentence many times. He was a man, not a black man. He talked to me about the races he suffered one time in his life. And he died, I was 24 years old. He talked to me about it one time in his life. And he actually didn't talk about it. I understand he was talking about it. Mm -hmm. I understand he was talking about something who paid me, but he was a tough, strong man, never. So he didn't put me this in me. So when I decided to travel in the USA, I could like rent a car, I could have a little budget and driving across the country. And knowing, knowing the history of America, but nobody was behind me telling me all the time, if you're going to be pulled over by the cop, you have one chance out of two, they're going to kill you. Because that's what we say to some people. There's like a, they did poll about people. They did poll about in, in, the, in this country, a lot of black people think like there's thousands, thousands of unarmed black men killed by the police every year. Thousands. When it's, in, it's too much, but it's less than 15. Like on, I think the last in 2021, 20, I think it was 12, for instance. That's mm -hmm. 12 more. That's 12 too many. Too many. Mm -hmm. But that's 12. When people think it's 1,000, as I think it's 1,000 people put this. So at least nobody put me this fear and everything in the society now and uh, in corporation and like uh, the work only put fear on people and they're not going to yes. achieve anything and they're ruining their life. They're ruining their life. The woke movement is really going to be looked back in history as a beautifully run propaganda machine that and is insanity. People wonder, uh, I have this conversation a lot with people and, you know, we, we go back and forth, but like, we always ask each other, like, how do you, how do you think the Holocaust was able to be achieved at the pace and the way that they were able to round up people and how, 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 how can people stand yeah. by when people yeah. are just being maimed in the street? How? This is how. Manipulation, brainwashing, mm -hmm. and fear. Fear, mm -hmm. fear that if you speak up, you'll be next. Fear. Mm -hmm. Fear is a motivator. Yeah. Fear is one of the greatest things that any 
politician or historian uses. They use it to spin anything positive and make you afraid of it when most of the time there isn't a reason to be afraid of it. Mm -hmm. They do it everywhere. Yeah, it's it's a lot. You know, I have a college degree in history, which doesn't make me a great historian, but I need to have a deep love and actually study Mm -hmm. history for a long time. And there's a lot. Read book about history. Read book of the of the rise. I mean, it was so upsetting to suddenly, because of his look or because of Youssef, oh, Trump is Mussolini, Trump is Hitler. That was so damn stupid. And that was so damn an insult to people who suffer this time. Mm-hmm. And you can read book of history and we're going to explain you how the, how the Nazi rise in Germany between World War I and World War II. This is absolutely studied and documented. There might be like different opinion about historian, but we know how it went. And it's not the way. And for instance, there's something which uh, we were invited by Germany during the Second World War, France, you know, and mm-hmm. like most of the country collaborate with, the Germ- with German- Germany, with the Nazi regime, to the point when we are of society, like the, uh, the, the train company, the railroad, railroad company, who put the Jewish people in wagon from Paris and other places to send them to concentration camps, you know. So we have this deep, dark history in the middle. The, we were a big part of the worst, the worst part of history of the 20th century, okay? Which is so funny when French people want to lecture America about racism or anything. Yeah. That I'm French, I don't respect this. But every American would say, you know, you did what you did during the Second World War. You did terrible things as a country, not everybody, but as a country, you know, that's a, that's a culture. Don't talk down about America because America is a country who will come and liberate the whole Europe and fight. We send people 17 years old, 18 years old. Again, I don't know why this kind of people shocked me because, yes, it shocked me. We send 17, 18 years old, 19 years old people from America, from everywhere in this country, from rural place like where I live right now, Franklin, Lippersburg, Tennessee, to fight in Europe and to die. And they liberate not only Europe from, from Nazis, they liberate France, my homeland, they liberate France, you know. So we send, we, 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 we send these people. But in France, we always say like, them, oh, I know what you would have done during the Second World War mm. when a politician would say, oh, you will have collaborated, etc. But actually, the one who collaborate, when the one, the one who went with the mainstream power, the mainstream power was Germany invited us and was Vichy, the, you know, uh, because the General de Gaulle went to London and entered resistance. But there's some people, politicians, in a city called Vichy, that was a regime, the Vichy regime was collaborating with Germany. So my point is like, when all these people say, were saying back in the day, basically it was Trump, and now basically if you're conservative or Republican, basically you're a fascist, basically yes. you're racist, etc., etc. But actually, the left and the Democrats are the ones who push everything, which is not questioning what the, the power in place say. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what happened in every fascist regime. It's when the population, a big part of the population, they don't question you anymore. They're like, yes, we should put these people in jail. Or yes, mm-hmm. January 6th was like so terrible, we should put every people in jail. January 6th was stupid, ridiculous. The people who went inside and do this, it was a mascara, it was stupid. See, this is a threat to democracy the fragility of these people, if that was a strategy. But in a general way, what happened to the, during the COVID, people asked for more restrictions. People were okay for, oh, people want, we shouldn't get them out of the hospital and should die if they want to get the vaccine, etc. So you never question what the power in place told you. And the power in place now is politician, is corporation. You never mm-hmm. question what the NBA, the NBA put, a bubble and black life manner on the floor, and you like, this is fantastic. Meanwhile, as I say, it's just a little example. They don't have one single NBA black photographer. They don't have one single black NBA photographer. 
They employed more than 30 NBA team photographers, not one black, which is fine for me. I know most of them. Most of them, I couldn't do their job. They are much more talented than me. And I would never want a job because I'm black. But my point is like, when you have no questioning on the power in place, yes, I know what you will have done during the Second World War. You will not have been in the resistance. Yeah. And when Trump was elected, and if you love a little history, if you study this, when Trump, uh, uh, Trump was elected in 2016, and people were like, resist, we need to be resistant. You would not have been a resistant in the world too. And you're not resistant because this is stupid. You, you don't have it in you. The, you <laughs> didn't have it in you. And this is stupid. Trump was never the fa fascist racist they told us. And actually, Biden and his administration do, they do stuff. They prevent us against for, for Trump. They say, Trump going to do this. That's, that's Biden. It's a really evil. You know, I've listened to so many podcasts recently about where, what's going on in the world in terms of Russia and all, everything like that. And it seems like there is a lot of scholars and a lot of individuals saying that we're being pushed towards a nuclear war because of Biden, because the United States is pushing and pushing and pushing this proxy war. And I, I would argue they're right. And that's hard for some people to say that the United States is going to be the reason for this when they say, well, Russia came into Ukraine, blah, 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 blah. Well, okay, listen, five years ago in the New York Times, Ukraine was one of the most corrupt governments in all of the world. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. you know, there's, I get it. There's tragedy there. And there's a lot of loss of life there, which I think is unnecessary and unneeded, like any of these other wars that we just abandoned and totally forgot as of last year that 20 years yes. were just happening. So yes. when I see people say, oh, I would have stood up or oh, I would have said something, we went through in Canada something very similar this February. Mm -hmm. I don't know how yeah. much you paid attention, but my entire country shut down because individuals are not allowed to leave the country freely or go to America unless you're vaccinated. Uh, up until a month ago, Canadians were the only people in the world that couldn't leave their province or their country if they didn't get a vaccine from the government. Let me state that again. Canada, 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 free Canada, the one that is your hat that is currently on fire, was not allowing its citizens to leave the province, get on a bus, a train, or a taxi out of Canada if you were not double vaccine. This is insane, yeah. And now, now, <laughs> this is awesome. Canada has gotten so much worse that we are one of the only countries, again, Canada, your hat, mm -hmm. America, your hat is on fire because we have now just welcomed in the CCP police force into our cities. We have Chinese outposts in Vancouver and in Toronto to follow Chinese dissidents who have authority on Canadian soil. Does anybody else get what's happening here? That's insane. Yeah. My point is no one is going to be a part of this resistance unless they actually be a part of this resistance. Yes. You saw that it took long haul truck drivers like my parents to stand up in February and go, mm -hmm. this is not acceptable. We are treating individuals. And now you have got the new person, individual cabinet member, whatever you want to call her running Alberta, which is the Texas of Canada. Uh -huh. You have got her stating as of yesterday, she was sworn in on a Tuesday. And by Thursday, she put in for a human rights violation towards the government stating that the unvaccinated have, she has never seen more discriminated against individuals in her lifetime. Mm. It is a problem when people say that they want to stand up and fight for something, but they don't. They don't. Yeah. They want comfort. They want security. And they want to live their lives unencumbered. Unfortunately, yeah. change is uncomfortable. Life mm -hmm. is uncomfortable. And something that I took from you that you said that was really beautifully, really beautifully said was, I spent a life learning to be comfortable in the uncomfortable. Yeah. But that mm -hmm. is why you are successful and where you are today, because you didn't stop fighting. You didn't stop fighting the dragons. You didn't give in. And you didn't say to your friend, your wife's friends, oh, you know what? I'm sorry I upset you about that. Maybe I'll change my views to make you feel more comfortable. Yeah. You said, fuck that. 
I am who I am. Love me if you love me. If you don't, too damn bad. Find somebody else to pick on, to bully, to put fear into. And that, my friend, when you asked me at the beginning of the show, why do you want to talk to me? Why do you want to talk to me? Listen, I don't know why. I don't know why you want to talk to me, Kelsey. You have uh, people on the show. They're so fantastic. You do not need to talk to me. I just uh, do photography, you know. And I said, that's that's it. That's it, exactly. And I said, I want to talk to you because you, my friend, are different. Mm. You hold values, you stand up for what you believe in, and you're yeah. really, really, really talented individual. And that is Thank why you. I wanted to talk to you. Thank you so much. And I praise my wife also because she stand, we yes. stand by each other on this because it costs uh, her too. I know my position, and we talk about this, she's a writer, she's a screenwriter, but she doesn't want to be silent neither. But my position, we know, my position hurt her professionally, but she's the same. We stand by principle and, you know, and the thing which is beautiful with her, she, she raised, she raised two, uh, two sons or two sons, you know, but before that, she took care of so some nephew, you know, uh, younger, and uh, she raised men and she raised people to be, uh, she raised this man to have a, a place, a, in, in the society, in society, in the in the in the in to have a place in the society and to be men and to be safe, you know, in a way, you know. So she she fight the thing which go against against them. They are unfor- they kind of like in in twenty twenty two. They are unfortunate to be uh, two boys, two boys, and and they are unfortunate to be white. And unfortunately, yeah. they're not poor either. So it's, you know, so at some point, like, you know, she's like, no, I'm not going to apologize because my kids are the way they are, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, so, so I praise her also, you know, she, she stand by my side and I stand by her side, you know, on this, yeah, I think. That's you know, you not easy. You don't want to talk at some point, but you have to talk. You have to talk because there's an all youth movement. We cannot be silent anymore. It. Hey, it happened to us this year with Brass and Unity. I stood up during the yeah. protest and I made a sign and I held it and I said, hold the line. And I meant it and yeah. I meant it and I, and I don't walk it back. But my father-in-law very quietly brought me to the side, a very successful businessman who understands mm-hmm. that sometimes things you say can affect your life. Yeah. said, are you will, are you, he said, Kelsey, are you ready to lose it all over this? Mm. I said, of course, yeah. because somebody has to do something. Somebody has to say something yeah. we Absolutely. cannot. I can't live with myself. People yeah. just say I'm loud and verbose or you just talk to no, talk. Yeah. I don't. No. I don't. I don't put my life and my career and my company on the line to talk. I talk because it needs to matter. And it, it matters to someone. Somebody yeah. else out there is going to hear this and go, holy shit. I do not have to follow that path. I do not have to do what the news says. I don't have to do what those around me. I can be my own person and have my own views. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't have to lose everything. Yeah. For this. Yeah. Yeah. And this and and, and the fact also, like you get a lot from this. Yeah, you lose, you lose opportunity. Uh, you know, you lose opportunity professionally, but you get a lot for this. Like, you know, it's everything makes sense at some point i have mm-hmm. so many friendships for the last two two years they are directly the result of me okay i might lose some stuff you might don't like me but i'm i cannot be silent and i cannot say lie and i cannot like clap to the lies spread by other people and i gain so many great friendship and great people and and the respect and the respect and the friendship. And I'm still this kid from tour from this small town in France. I get respect and, and friendship from some people. Uh, I cannot I cannot believe it sometimes. I'm like, you know, I'm still pinching myself, you know. And and I don't care. I mean, some people, I get friendship from people I love, and this friendship gonna get me more in, in trouble, you know, you know what I mean? I'm gonna, mm-hmm. you know. I'm going to talk about, you know, I'm, I'm friends recently from, with uh, Nick Cersei, the actor Nick Cersei. And I'm very proud of this friendship. I love mm-hmm. the man. 
And this man has, you know, and we have conversation. He's, he's very smart. And he was, two days ago, we were having a glass of bourbon together in this place. And uh, yeah, and I, I want also to, be, to, stand, to stand by the side of these people. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about these people, you know, and the work they do. Exercia has been like very, uh, uh, spoke a lot, uh, sp he speaks a lot on, on Twitter, etc. He doesn't, he doesn't shut up and he shouldn't shut up. That's right. And what he, he, when, what he believes in and who is, is absolutely beautiful. I, fuck. You're, I you know, I, surpassed my expectations, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. you really I'm going to blush now. <laughs> no, it's true. Listen, you uh, can blush or do whatever the hell you want with hair like that. You can, you can just stand there. That's fine. No. You don't have to say a word for an hour and a half. That's more than fine. <laughs> can you tell me what's coming next for you, Chris? What's it look like? I know you're kind of getting off of social media right now and you're, you're focusing yeah. on your new puppies and your life and this new, yeah. this new like chapter between you and your wife. So what do we have to look forward to from you? Okay. We, we still are just adjusting to a uh, boss of zombie and like one is out of college. He graduated from college in May. He started a new job, his first job in, in June uh, in uh, New York city. And the second one graduated in May from high school and he started at West point. He goes, he, he's going to West wow. Point. We're still adjusting with his mother, uh, the mother and I to this life without them because uh, I'm known them for 10 years. And that was the best duty, the best part of my life. It was raising this, helping raising these two, two boys. And I, I love them more than, more than anything in the world. And so it's an adjustment, but we are very lucky. We live in a beautiful ranch in Tennessee, 40 acres. Uh, I'm I'm an aspiring, aspiring farmer, so we're going to have some sheep and stuff with my neighbor. We're going to start to work on this, like, see, etc. So that's the stuff I want to do. I want to be much more like close to the land. I'm a city boy. I have mm. this chance, incredible chance to live in the country now to have some acreage. So I want to, I want to walk on the land and with the land. We want to raise some, we raise some own vegetable stuff like this, like simple stuff. That, that's one part. Um, and I actually want to uh, launch two podcasts. Oh! Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, my older son, I'm giving credit to him, like Thomas, my older son, like pushed me with this. Like when I started to be vocal in 2020 and to the presidential run, he said, you need to. And I was not ready. And honestly, I was telling him, if I do this, I'm going to lose. I'm, I'm not going to be able to cover the NBA anymore. So I was kind of like a co-op for, for, for this anyway. But And I was not sure. But then I'm going to do it now. I want to do two two podcasts. I'm going to do one in French. And basically ah. for the French French market. And one, it's going to be like, you might love or hate America, but stop thinking you know America. I'm going to tell you about my experience with loving America since I was a king, traveling in this country for 25 years, living here for 10 years, U.S. citizen, married to an American woman, all my friends are American, etc. I travel most than more American in this country, so I know the culture. I know that. Let me call you. Let me follow me and about. I'm going to tell you about my journey and my experience and what I know about America. Then you might love America finally, as you didn't love America, or you might hate it. But America is not what they say in the media in France because they have the mirror of the left media in this country. So that it's terrible. And America is not the TV show, uh, your, your Jimmy Kimmel, et cetera, this kind yeah. of stupid talk, not stupid, this kind of talk show with that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> all right. And, and it's, not, it's not the movie neither. It's, not, right. it's really not this. So follow me on the stuff. I want to do this on French market. It's my way. It's, it's big world. It's my way to give back to America. So I want to do this. And I want to do one in, in English for the American market, which I will start next year. And it will be about the same thing. I love this country. I want to give back. But this is what I love. This is a different perspective for American people. I hope to have like, I don't want to have a black audience, but I also want to keep saying to the black, you know, I was not born in, in your hood. I was not born in your city or inner city. I was right. not that born. But if I, if I was able to see this coming from 
poor people in France, as an immigrant with my face, you might do stuff. Don't only listen to the fear people put in you. I'm going to tell you, this is what you could achieve in America. But that's not the, the whole point. The whole point is like to give back and to have conversation as an immigrant uh, who became a U.S. citizen, who loves this country. We're going to be, I'm going to be buried in this country. I'm actually going to be buried on my property. Oh. I talked to the, about this with my wife. She's agree with it. And, uh, and I have like, I have peace to know it. decades from now, I'm only 51. But uh, I'm going to be very in the place. I have this little Thompson on my property. And from where I come from, it's amazing. So I want to give back, to have conversation with other Americans. And a lot of people, I want to talk about my experience. I want to talk about what I think about society, etc. I want to be, I really want to be, and people, a lot of people want to, I'm not going to like it. I want to be another voice, another conservative voice. In, in America at my small level with a different experience, you know. So nice. that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna start the one in French one by the end of the year, beginning of next year, and around March, April, the one in American. And, uh, and uh, being a, an aspiring, a, a modest farmer on my land. Well, good. I'm going to listen to both of them in both languages and I'll bone up on my French. So our next episode we do together can be in French. Absolutely. I would love that. Avec plaisir. Oh, may we? Oh, he's there. He goes. This is what happens. This is what happens. It's over. As soon as that starts, my brain goes yeah. to mush. It's been an absolute pleasure and honor Thank to you. have somebody as talented, as well-rounded, and as much of a deep thinker as I've just had with you on this episode. Can you please tell everyone where they can find you on social media and to follow the new podcast that you have coming? Okay, I keep my account for your mind. F R O. Uh, W-O-Y-O-U-R-M-I-N-D. -D. Wow. I'm <laughs> oh, your mind. That's my main Instagram account. That's the only one I, I keep. Now, I have a one which is kind of private, which I use just for the family and my very yeah. close friend. But for your mind, I, I haven't deleted it. I keep it. And when I'm going to launch my podcast, I'm going to use it to launch the podcast to, to, know, to let Smart. people know. Yeah, that's smart. It's brilliant. Well, it's been yeah. a pleasure and we'll make sure to put everything in the bio. Uh, anything else, Chris? Nothing. Uh, <laughs> again, uh, I praise God and, uh, and I praise my wife because she has been like a, an anchor in my life for the last 10 years. And the best thing I had in my life is meeting my, my wife, Gigi Levenji, and raising my two sons, Patrick and uh, Thomas Grazer. So that's uh, uh, everything I got is thanks to God and uh, with a little help and a huge help from my, my wife. And she gave me the best thing in my life, which is uh, the fatherhood of Thomas and Patrick. God, you just blow my mind, Chris. Everyone else, I hope you enjoyed this episode. We'll see you all next week.